What's up, guys? Welcome to episode two of the Max Off-Road podcast. I was fortunate enough to have the Aussie Will Reardon, the factory gas gas rider, in the studio with us today. He is an amazing athlete and person, and I hope you enjoy this podcast. Stay tuned for a quick word from our sponsors, and let's get into it. This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Designs. Bulletproof Designs are high quality billet aluminum protective parts for your dirt bike made right here in the USA. What I love so much about my Bulletproof products is the silky smooth installation and the insurance it buys me on keeping my bike safe. I've been using Bulletproof Designs since 2012 and have had great luck with all of their products. Bulletproof Designs products come with a lifetime warranty so if you damage something, you know they got your back. If you want to keep your bike safe so you can keep riding weekend after weekend, head on over to bulletproofdesigns.com and order some parts today. This episode is brought to you by SXS Slide Plates. SXS Slide Plates are high density UHMW skid plates made right here in the USA. These skid plates smoothen the transition between your frame and your linkage so that you can slide over rocks, logs, and other trail obstacles while you're in the mountains. These skid plates are designed to save you time on the track, money in your wallet, and wear on your bike. Head on over to sxsslideplate.com and enter code MAX15 at checkout. That's MAX15 at checkout to get a discount on your order and help support the podcast. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Climb. Climb makes off-road and adventure gear for the hardcore enthusiast. The latest addition is their XC Pro line of gear. This gear is designed to be flexible, lightweight, while staying durable and ready for action. I've been with Climb since 2008. They were one of my first sponsors and we've been together this whole time. They have great gear and now they're supporting all of the hard enduro efforts here in the States. They support us, so go support them. Thank you guys for getting through these ads with us. These companies help keep the podcast going. We wouldn't be able to do it without them. I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's run it. All right, so I got my man, the Aussie Will Reardon in town, doing a little bit of riding. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. I feel special. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. Lucky number two. Lucky number two. Nice. Lucky number two. So we're just going to take this ride, figure this thing out. Perfect. What's, first one. Yeah. First podcast. For me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Second one for me. So you're a little ahead. Both learning. Uh, yeah, both learning. <laughs> What's life like for you? You're down here, you're traveling, you're training, you're riding. What's going on? Yeah. The last, I'd say four months have been pretty, well, really every every month's busy but uh living in north carolina at the moment but i haven't been back there for four months probably so we had enduro cross the end of last year and then for christmas i went home to australia which is really good caught up with friends and family and then january and a bit of february i was in canada training with tristan just riding trials and gym and everything which is really good and then First round was uh, Feb, and then been down here ever since. And then we got Paige in a couple of weeks. So just getting ready for that. Nice. What's it like being an Aussie and coming to the States and now traveling all over and going to Canada and staying here in Arizona now? Like, what's it like for you? Yeah, I love it. I love traveling, seeing new places. Honestly, I don't like being in one area for too long. Like, I, I miss home, home being North Carolina and Australia. But I get to, I'll get back there and I'll be like, all right, after a few weeks, it's, I want to go, go somewhere else. Kind of always looking for, I, I don't know, I get bored or, not bored, but I just, I just like to do everything. Ways to keep it fresh. Yeah. I feel like traveling is a, is a way to keep everything fresh because you're always adjusting, always figuring out new things, different food, different terrains to ride. Yeah. And I don't know, growing up, lived in, probably my whole life, I've lived in six different spots, maybe. So maybe that's why it's just normal. I always kind of swap and change and looking for something new. And you came here, you and your family came here in what, 2018? Yeah. 
halfway through 2018, so I would have been 16. That's when I met you at the Reno Enduro Cross in 2018, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because we... No, at Donna, hi, uh, Donna Hair Scramble. Really? It was the first, I think, because that was our first ever race over here. And uh, me, myself, dad and Gus, uh, dad and brother, uh, we went up to sign on and we, we, we didn't know anything really. We didn't even really know what the race was. We just turned up, got on Google. Dad's like, search, search a place up and we'll go. Really? So turned up, you were the champ at that stage. You were kind of the man there, but we didn't know. We didn't know anything. And uh, actually, yeah, and then you're like, well, no, because you knew us. Because you told us, no, nah, these boys need to be in pro, which is funny. So obviously I felt like the man. Must have been after the Reno. So then. maybe you saw us at Reno and then then we got talking at Donna. Yeah, that must have been it. Because I remember I had a broken hand at Reno and then I wasn't racing, but I was yeah. just there hanging out. And then yeah. I saw you guys ripping. And I'm like, who are these guys? <laughs> And then I went and talked to you. I'm like, they have accents yeah. too? What the fuck? Where do they come from? Who yeah. are these people? And then it was just like, it seemed like you you guys just stormed the scene. They've been getting better ever since. It was funny. When we first started, because we did the first couple enduro crosses, we did, Gus and I were just on one two fives, hard tires, no skid plates, no rotor guards, no nothing. Didn't know at the time. I was probably last year, I was looking at videos and photos. I'm like, what? We didn't even have any any stuff. Just funny, no idea, no idea, no gear. But it was it was fun because come from Australia, we just see all that stuff on TV, you know. So to get over here and and be able to race and duo cross and against guys like you that we've only seen on TV in a different country, it's pretty surreal. That's pretty wild. What's yeah. it like being? What What were your inspirations growing up? to ride dirt bikes, to be involved with dirt bikes and, and ultimately to come to the United States to race. Yeah. So our situation's a bit unique. I always wanted to come to either here, like the States or Europe. I feel like you need to, in Australia, it, you just get tapped out. Like the market's too small. We just don't have many people. It's like all sport. Want to be the best at basketball, baseball, you come here uh, and stuff like that. So, but then our situation's a bit unique because we come here for dad's work mum and dad had business over here so when um they said do you want to move over i was like fuck yeah let's go gus was a bit hesitant uh just leaving friends and family and but at the time i was like no like this is perfect let's go so that was pretty sick to to come to the states like that he's a little younger too yeah 15 months so we're pretty close, which is good growing up. We're pretty similar. What type of TV and exposure do you guys have to off-road racing in Australia? Growing up, just DVDs back yep. then. Sound like I'm old, but uh, <laughs> I forget. Just watching motocross. Um, a lot of hair and hound stuff because we used to follow Toby Price pretty um, regularly. Or just, you know, what he was doing and stuff. And then he come over and did a hare and hound. So then that's what we wanted to do, race hare and hound. We knew about that. Works, um, GNCC. So just, and like we didn't have Instagram back then. I probably got it when when I moved over here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just DVDs and, and YouTube, I'd say. Did you watch any of the old, I grew up on like Terra Firma, Krusty Demon, Steel Roots. Like yeah, all crusty. those, did you Nitro, watch all that stuff? Yeah, Nitro Circus, um, mountain bike and stuff like Brandon Seminuck. He's so gnarly. Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah, although our time was, we we're always outside. Like we didn't have Playstations or we watched TV and stuff, but mum and dad were pretty, not, I guess, strict, like not letting us watch too much stuff. It's it's sort of telling in, in with knowing you guys and, and your personalities, I would say that you and the other Aussies that I know, they all seem to be pretty like grounded and kind of calm and, and aware, I would say. Whereas like a lot of the people, maybe other people, not even really comparing with other people, but 
it's, it's not easy to find like good grounded, solid people that are aware of what's going on and are appreciative for what they have. And it shows through, it shows in your, in your writing and, and just like who you are. I feel like. And for sure, try to be, I don't want to be arrogant or, and I feel like that's just who we are. I don't know. It's an Australian thing, I guess. Maybe because we, like Australia is unreal. Like I love it, but we know what it's like back there as, as far as racing goes. So we get here and and it's unreal and we want to stay and do well and keep racing over here. Maybe that's it. Where I think if you grow up here, this is all you know. So maybe you take it for granted more, I don't know. But for sure, try and be level-headed. What um, what has your progression or your, your rise to the point that you're at now looked like? Because you came here late 2018 race race some enduro cross it seemed like you sort of figured out what you liked what worked for you and then mm. your brother kind of chose one way you chose another yeah. and then you guys have just sort of kind of gone like this i feel like up until this point and now you're on factory gas gas kind of have the all the opportunity that you could ever want right in front of you at this point so what is that how is that yeah we gus and i have both done everything really we grew up racing motocross. Well, when we were young, it was flat track and then enduro. And then... Flat track? Yeah, so like in the circle. Really? Yeah, it's got like one corner. Really? Uh, speedway. Speedway. Yeah, yeah. Speedway. Like when we were With like young. those funny looking bikes? We just used our dirt bikes, but... What did you ride for that? Uh, Just on our 65s. But we really? had like a trials tire. It was hard rubber. No like way. Trials tire, yeah. Was that just because that's what you had? Where I grew up, yeah, it was big. It's so I grew up in Madura in Victoria on the Murray River. And Speedway's huge there. Like where you have a lot of I don't know, I don't really know really, but definitely at least one world champion from there. Really? Yeah. Um, Is it sand there? Mad- yeah. Mad- so then desert racing's big also. Okay. So growing up there was pretty much dirt bikes in the winter and then on the river, water skiing and stuff in the summer. So okay. it's pretty sick. Kind of like Arizona life. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. But anyway, so grew up, bit of flat track and then motocross really heavy until we were, I was 12. And then it kind of just got over it. Like just the same. I didn't really enjoy it. You know, motocross, it's a bit more serious. We're off-road, so much more relaxed. Um, and it's what I'd ridden, lived on a farm that backed onto the national park. So I always rode in the bush. Um, so then when I was 12, we switched to off-road and then moved here when I was 16 and then did works, hair scrambles, bit of enduro cross, started to do the hard enduros in 2020, maybe did some GNCCs. So kind of did everything. And then. Probably 21 was when I chose that I was going to do hard enduro and enduro cross because it got to that age where I was like, need to pick something now. Need to pick something. Yeah. yeah. Because if you do it all, then you'll just be good at everything instead of great at certain things. Yeah. What made you choose to go the hard enduro and enduro cross route? I used to enjoy it the most. Like looking back, even I'd go to, we'd be at the motocross track practicing and on the way to the from like the car park to the to the track, there'd be a K rail or a pile of mulch or something. I'd ride over it. So looking back, I've always liked the technical aspect, maybe riding in the bush. Um, so then moving over here, we have hard enduros and enduro cross, like the best of the best. So it was, it was perfect. We're in Australia. There's a bit more now, but when I was there, there was nothing. So I got lucky that uh. We moved here and I could do it here. Sick. Yeah. I feel like there's so much more that you can pull from being riding off road. I mean, I mm. love motocross and I think it's fun, but off road, you have the riding element, which you get with motocross, but like the actual riding and the physical activity of riding, yeah. which is fun. And then you also get like this exploration aspect yeah. too, where you get to go explore and see things and yeah. go to a place where dirt bike hasn't been. So there's like another part of it that fulfills you in a different way. Yeah. Honestly, that's probably my favorite. Like I love the outdoors. I love exploring. And that's 
Honduras. Like you go out with your buddies. It's different now. We got training's pretty, you know, down the line. But there's nothing better than all the boys going out, exploring, riding, looking at the mountain, thinking, "Can we get to the top and we make it? Sick view. Everyone's there. Yeah, it's good. Every once in a while, you find something cool, like an old piece of metal. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, in the mountains, creeks, like where no one, hardly anyone's been. <laughs> I'm always looking. I'm always yeah. on the hunt. Always looking yeah, down. Yeah, you're always finding shit. <laughs> nah, I'm useless at that. Useless at finding <laughs> shit. Um, with the flat track background, I was wondering, do you feel like that created a foundation for like clutch, throttle, and brake control that you can use in your career now? Yeah, for sure. And dad was big on that because he didn't race when he was little. But so when we started... He had been riding for a few years, but he didn't know anything about racing or the future or technique or anything. So he, we were both learning, if that makes sense, at the same time. But he was always big on technique, and we got a lot of coaching. A um, couple coaches, a lot with Greg Moss when we were little. He's a pretty big coach in Australia. And then later on with Ross Beaton. Um, but Dad was always big on the technique. And he'd be a sponge at the... At the coaching clinics too like he'd obviously be there listening to everything then we get home and then he'd help us after huh. work and whatnot yeah so he's been so your dad would join in on your classes with the guy with your coaches and then yeah he would, he would help reiterate that to you throughout your career basically yeah hey remember hope you know remember to keep your toes in the foot pegs whatever yeah yeah throw rocks at us <laughs> nah he didn't get like that but like everyone's dad was there and for sure, there's some dads that were just chatting in the car park, not not too fast. But I feel like dad was always listening and being involved and learning. Because us kids, with a lot of the information, would just fly over our head. Yeah, exactly. So we get in the car and he'd... I feel like it's important to uh, to to have that. Like when I do my classes, sometimes I'm talking to these kids and it's like I don't know if they're soaking it up. A lot of times they do, even though it seems like they're not. But to have the parents there helping and kind of like absorbing with you, then, th then they know how to communicate with their kid. Yeah. Also. Yeah. I think it's obviously the most important for the kid to, you know, soak it up, but then having parents that are pretty supportive, it makes it, I think, I think that's so important. Yeah. Um, hundred percent. Yeah. I've been lucky with that. How strict was your parents with your racing and your training? Was it like, we're here to do a job and this is business or let's just go have some fun or focusing on technique or what did that look like for you growing up? Yeah. I'd say as, as long as we did our best, it, it was perfect. Mom didn't care at all. Didn't know. It was just if we're having fun, it was perfect. Dad, he was strict, but I, it was for the better of us if that makes sense right he's like we're we're here to put this effort in yeah like say we'd like he used to put a lot of time in like we'd drive 10 hours get coaching for a few days then drive back and obviously he had work and stuff to do so if we wasted his time he had wasted his time he'd let us know um but if we we're trying our best he was pretty chill but for sure he lit us up for sure <laughs> he's been lit up a few times but we needed it we needed the kick in the ass to to um get into gear for sure yeah for sure it was good i feel like it it was good and what's it like growing up with a brother that's in your same sport i always i've always thought that if i had a brother things would be so much different or whatever and yeah here you are you have a younger brother and you have to kind of lead the way but you also have to learn together like what's yeah, it like having perfect. a little brother i'd say it's good not just for riding but for everything because we're so close in age too growing up i was always better just naturally and then for sure he caught up so like it was good because we get to do everything together and and learn and stuff but then the shit bit was you had to deal with your little brother fucking waxing you <laughs> um, that's why you had to switch disciplines so you yeah get that's get what waxed I by about. Gussie. Like, people say why do you do hard and do i'm like because gus isn't good at that <laughs> he actually is pretty good at that but dude he's fast yeah now nah, he's doing good he's doing really good didn't he just win like a, he won the first round of the GNCCs. That's pretty sick. And second at the 
last weekend, so he's got the points there. It's gnarly. But yeah, it was good having both of us grow up and, and for sure it's made both of us a better rider. Because like, I was always better, but then he caught up, he'd get better, then I'd get better. So like every week it was, it was different, but we both just progressed evenly, I'd say. Um, but then he just enjoys his stuff more and I enjoyed the my stuff more it's such a funny story that you guys both grew up and then you know you guys both sort of transitioned from motocross into the off-road world and then you kind of both tried everything in the off-road world and then you both picked separate things yeah separate things there i wonder if it's like a personality trait yeah i think so i'd say i'm more of a chill person for sure he's more serious i don't know if serious is the word but he yeah, I don't know. He he's happy to just stick it out and not be miserable, but like he's got dog in him for sure. Where I like, I think uh, I get. We both do in our own ways, you know. Because hard and dry, you need that. But I don't want to be pounding laps out in a sand track with this big whoops, you know, in Florida. So forty-five then, minute motos. Yeah, but then we do our. Six hour races in the humidity of Tennessee, so it's it goes both ways. I enjoy that more. He enjoys that, so it's it works out. I feel like I would get burned out quicker doing that type of racing, where it's like there's a certain amount of of suffering that you sort of have to put into it, yeah, to to yield the return that you desire, yeah. And it's the same with hard enduro enduro cross, but it's you can change it up enough where it doesn't get so monotonous along the way. Yeah, exactly. Like if he was doing hard and dry, I'd, he'd get burnt out quickly. If I was just doing GNCC and the same stuff every week, I'd get burnt out. Um, but we're lucky with hard and dry. Kind of any riding is a good practice. Anything. So like our training consists of either sections like um, technique work, like play riding, perfect sprints on a track, motos, like every different aspect and so many different terrains, it all adds up. For sure. Which I enjoy. How much do you change it up between motos, uh, like hard enduro motos? Like let's just say that you're preparing for a hard enduro season. How much do you actually change it up? Do you ride motocross? How much regular off-road riding are you doing? What Motos, trials, gym, cycling, like how do you decide what's your approach and how do you decide what all you're going to mix in? Cause there's only so many hours in the day and only so many things you can do throughout the week. Yeah. Um, and without overdoing it also. And without overdoing it. So how do you pick what is the right thing for you to do? Yeah. Well, our trainer, Jared trained you too, but he makes it really good. Um, just from giving me a schedule, but, Say this week, for example, uh, I think we'll ride, normally ride three to four times, gym two times a week, and then some cardio another two times. So a lot of the days it's two activities a day, uh, and then one to two rest days. Depends like when. So we're coming up to race now, so it's a couple rest days a week. Where if it, we're just training in a training block, one rest day a week, and it's pretty heavy every other day. Um, so like yesterday on the bike, we did five twenties, um, on some different tracks. The day before that, it was an hour and a half moto. Day before that, it was section work. And then tomorrow we're doing an hour 20 moto again. So it's same stuff, but every day is different. If that makes sense, just a cycle for sure. And do you make your motos and your sprints for hard enduro, do you make it really difficult like mm. it would be in the race? Or do you make it moderately difficult so that you can get through it and get your training in without taking big risk and also keeping everything sort of controlled? Because mm. I always found when I made it, when I made my moto, my motos in hard enduro like too difficult, I was like almost just kind of getting my ass kicked the whole time. Yeah. But it was also good because then when you'd go to the race, it was like, I'm getting my ass kicked, but I'm not uncomfortable in this situation. Yeah. It's always different 
say like if we're doing section work and playwriting, like shit gets out of hand and we'll be doing really gnarly stuff. But say if we're doing an hour and a half moto, it'll be more still stuff where like you could either make it or you couldn't. So you got to be fully switched on, say if it's a hill climb or a certain rock embankment, whatever it may be, like you got to be fully switched on and, and make it first go. So it's like on the line stuff. Right. Uh, so if you don't make it, you it, you lose a lot of time. Um, kind of hard to explain, but... And then say like sprints, same kind of thing. Yeah, I feel like that's good because then, you know, you ride the transfer sections basically and you have to like keep your heart rate within check and keep your breathing smooth so that when you show up to the difficult stuff, you can stay clocked in and yeah. nail it first try. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not easy stuff, but it's not impossible. But it's for sure stuff you really need to make sure you get first go. For sure. Um, which is, I think, perfect. And honestly, that's what our races is. If you get stuff first lap, yeah. our first try every go, you make up so much time where one fuck up on another, then you lose energy, you, everything goes out the window then. That's where I feel like hard enduro, it's so important to play ride and develop as a rider yeah i feel like motos are important but if all you're doing is hard enduro motos i feel like you almost fall back because you like you lose your adaptability and your learnability i feel like the guys that are i mean look at the guys who are the best like cody webb and tristan and you and Ryder. you guys can all go session some gnarly gnarly hill climbs and feed off each other and like just expand your skill set and your rolodex of of skills and things that you can see process and have already done it so you already know how to approach it i feel like that's almost more important there's there's a point because you have to be fit and you have to be able to put in the motos but if that's all that you're doing you're almost sacrificing your ability to go up that stuff it's almost more important to be able to there's more time to be made up by getting up stuff the first try yeah and that's what Tristan's really good at. Like it might take him, say we're play riding and it's a really gnarly section. Might take him a few times to unlock it, if that makes sense. But once he gets it, he gets it every time from then on. Where say myself or one of the other newer guys, let's say like we will have a few stuff ups after. We'll get it and then we'll get it again and then we'll stuff it. Is the robot once he gets yeah. once it's programmed, it's like it's in there. just enter, enter, yeah, enter, exactly. enter, up, up, yeah. up. <laughs> it's like it's already there. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, you're not wrong. What's yeah. your process look like when you're learning these new things? Because it's challenging. Like when you're trying to learn a new line on a trials bike, and you're trying not to put your feet down, or if you're trying to do a new hill climb and it seems impossible, how do you mentally? make it how do you make it happen mentally and then make it happen in the real world what's your process like for learning yeah i feel i'm pretty simple like i don't uh like to overthink stuff i think in the past that was an issue of mine overthinking stuff and sometimes it can still get the better of me but i think keeping it simple for me works not thinking about stuff too much but you make a mistake and then you try your best not to do it again say if you work in one section um whatever it may be that you stuffed up yeah but i think a lot of there's a few writers that uh overthink stuff and it just doesn't work um and for sure i can go down that hole but for me keeping it simple so not thinking about it too much yeah works i can see how there's a certain amount of thinking about it that would help but then beyond it to, that, it's, it gets to a point of diminishing returns. Then you're like just, rod. yeah. Then you're just thinking about it too much. Yeah. And then, Cause once you think about it too much, it's almost like you get rid of the instinctual element of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. When I go out and ride, especially recently, I've been having two things I need to work on. And then the main thing is 
being fully focused in the zone and thinking ahead like what's coming, setting up, not not thinking about every little detail where I need to be, just ride. Remember those couple of things that were bad from the last training session and then just be fully in the moment thinking about what's coming. And then if you're fully locked in and focused, that's when you're going to ride the best anyway. 100%. Not overthinking it, you're just thinking about what's coming. Yep, focusing on the next obstacle, the next turn. Yeah, that well, that's what works for me. I think it's, I mean, it's probably what works for most people. Simple. I mean, if you're gonna, if you sit there and break down an obstacle until the cows come home, like, okay, I'm gonna go up this, and then I'm gonna put pressure here, and then I'm gonna shift my weight, and then I'm gonna look ahead, and then I'm gonna come back, and I'm gonna come forward, then I'm gonna release the clutch, and then I'm gonna give it throttle, and then I'm gonna give it front brake, and then I'm not gonna overshoot it. It's like too Bro, much like, yeah get rid of your brain yeah to a degree like if you're if you're doing sections you can think it think like that to master what you're doing to unlock it but if you're doing motos or sprints yeah i can't be thinking like rup, that rup, rup, rup. make it happen go yeah yeah i always found that it was I, I think that for me walking the courses almost hindered me in that regard too for hard enduro it's funny. It's different from walking to riding. Stuff looks different. Oh, it looks so much different. Yeah. Things look, sh- your run ups look shorter. Things look steeper. You walk something and you're like, oh, dude, we'll go right up that. And then yeah. you get there and it's impossible. Yeah. And then there's other stuff that you see. Oh, there's no way we're making it up that. And you, brep, brep, and you're like you're up and over and it's fine. It's like, yeah. oh, man, I just went through all that brain damage for no reason Nothing. at all. Yeah. It's going to have a headache for no reason. Yeah. hundred percent. And I feel like, for, for me too, if I'm walking the track, it almost limits my creativity and my adaptability when the actual race comes because I'm already thinking about the line that I want to hit. So I'm like almost more focused on the line that I want to hit than just racing the course and going riding my dirt bike and going with the flow. Because like when you're when you're reading terrain, you come around a corner and there's a hill and you're looking at a, a, a hill, it's almost better to just like pick a line right then and there yeah yeah you know for sure yeah i'm a bit i like to see the track just and obviously you can't remember everything so i just remember key points or try and remember key stuff i feel like it just kind of speeds up the process especially if it's a hill for example and you got to break it down into switchbacks or whatever you know you've looked at it and you kind of got a, a game plan in your head and as you said it doesn't always go to plan but at least you know you get there and oh there's that line over here or there's if i get right. to here i can go to there right so you've got it all kind of planned out obviously not every hill but main points you yeah kind of just fast tracks it yeah and then if somebody's in your line then you can know oh there's another line that i can go around and come up over yeah. here or go to the left or whatever but then like say for tristan i keep saying tristan but he's the best um so everyone kind of looks at him but like I feel like he's uh, thinks about, well, I know, he thinks about stuff a lot, breaks stuff down. So I think for track walk, that's important for him. And he's got it dialed because um, he uses track walk to its full potential and really thinks about stuff and remembers stuff. Um, so I think if you, it's a special skill. If you can dial that, it for sure helps. Yeah, because he like maps it into his mind. Yeah, he has it all dialed yeah, before know. the gate even drops. Pushing the program and he's yeah, like, yeah, he's got it dialed. Not saying that he's bad at not walking the track, right? But he's really good at track walking because it's a skill. Taking advantage of that, yeah, it is a skill. Yeah, Taylor's really good at that too. Yeah, Taylor oh, Robert, he's the best, I think. Yeah, yeah, he's so good at like walking in a section and being like, then he hits. Thirty minutes digging out a little rock to cut a corner a bit for so they can less get than a second. This much closer to the inside yeah. stake or whatever. So I'm sure he picked up on that and brought it back over here. There's so much secrets to it too with the yeah. track rock thing. Like a lot of guys will walk in groups, and then there's some guys that like to walk individually, mm. and then a lot of times 
you know, if there's like a line that's not really a line yet, maybe you'll leave a couple trees and a couple bushes and a couple yeah. branches over there. And then you just kind of clear out the big stuff. Ooh, found a big rock. Let's get rid of that. Yeah. So you know that when you do come through yeah. there, it doesn't look like much, but you know, when I come through there, I'm going to bust through those little bushes and those trees yeah. that are there. And you that's going to be my line. For sure. Track walk. There's a few different groups that go out. Um, everyone's got their group, but then say within your group, if, you're walking with one of your competitors. You'll see something and then you like keep it quiet. Maybe the young kid will go, oh, like, look at that. We should go here and clean this out. But you should keep it quiet and keep it up your sleeve. Or if you see someone else that's looking at you, give them a wink. Yeah. <laughs> keep that yeah. one quiet, mate. Yeah. 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 I can but see. it's a skill. Yeah, I could see how track walking with people can be good because you have the, the camaraderie and you can you can be observant of what they're observing and you can maybe pick up something extra that you wouldn't on your own but then that door swings both ways also because you're looking for shit too yeah and they can kind of watch you and yeah. see what you're seeing yeah and you can kind of feed off each other and in yeah. some ways you make both each person gets better yeah and then you can go down the rabbit hole of oh that guy's thinking of doing this but that's I can no, I don't know if I can do that. But then that could just be playing with you. There's one guy specifically that does that. Who that plays with you for a track walk? Oh, it plays with everyone. Who? Ryder. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> he nah, he likes know. playing games like, oh we'll go right up that or something. Yeah. I don't know if he's playing games, but he has some crazy uh ideas on track some walk. Some tactics. Now I'm just like don't even listen. You can't let any of that stuff go to your head, huh? Yeah. No. Back in the day I was like like really? think about it all night yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ryder said he's gonna go right up that yeah isn't it amazing what you what your mind what you let you consume your mind the night before a race when it none of it matters yeah none of it matters at all worrying about stuff that hasn't happened worrying about stuff that hasn't happened yet yeah yeah it's like when you look back on it, it's like man that makes no sense that i worried about that i used to go into tko every year i used to worry that it was gonna rain and then yeah. I'm like, you can't get, yeah. yeah. I'm like, of course it's gonna rain. It yeah. rains every single year here. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. why would I even consider worrying about that? And then I was like, then I rains. just like flipped my mind. I'm like, I hope it rains. Yeah, it's gonna rain. I hope it rains. If it doesn't rain, it's the same for everybody, no matter what. Yeah. And and I'm gonna have to figure it all out, no matter what, when I'm out there. Yeah. So I'm done worrying about it. But then you worry about something. It happens. And then you're on the back foot. For a mud race, perfect example. Exactly. You can't control it. No, you can't. Yeah. yeah. Focusing on the things you can control is so big. On the subject of track walk, track walk, what's your take on that for the hard enduros? Do you think that track walking is a good thing, a bad thing? Do you think there should be a limit on it? What are your, do you think it pulls from the racing? Do you think it makes the racing better? What are your thoughts on that? I think if we didn't, it's hard to say. Maybe if we didn't track walk, it'd be a bit closer. You say Tristan, as I said, he's got track walking down to an art. He knows. He doesn't mess around. Um, and he's that's not the that's not the reason why he's the best, but it's for sure one of them. So I don't know. Maybe it would make racing closer, but it's also a different skill, like reading terrain when you come to it. I'm trying to think, like King of Motos, we don't track walk. Um, yeah, I think it'd be better because then you don't waste energy because, like, it gets out of hand. Um, yeah, because you just walk so much uh, the day before the race. Yeah, and just – but that's the thing. You need – because it's, a, like, uh, an option. Like, we need to. Like, if there's people walking the track and I don't, that's just silly. But it, right. if no one walks it, I think that's the guy. I'd be fine with that. Yeah. I think – I could see it from both sides, but I like to imagine a world where like the regular people that work Monday through Thursday and then get Friday off to drive to the race or Thursday off to drive to the race. I feel like it would level out the playing field a little bit for people that don't have. Yeah. Cause some, you, shit, sometimes you guys show up on a Tuesday and start mm, walking. I know it gets out of hand. Yeah. But then kids, it's, it's an option. You use it to the fullest potential. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it's an option, you have to do it. Yeah. So I think I'd be happy if they said no track walking. I think that'd be fine. It'd make the races more gnarly. Um, just even moving the slightest little rocks. Yeah. You're not supposed to, I think, now. But 
a tiny little rock can make a big difference. It really can. Yeah. Because then you'd have to do that in the race or go yeah. up at whatever it is without the rock. Well, I know like TKO for sure a couple of years ago, like the final loop, they made like messed up hard but they knew that we were going to mess with the rock so they were fine they're like do it here they'll fix it perfect but then at all the other u.s hardened rows they don't like it because we make it too easy you know so it's it's a tough position for the track builders too because you have to build a track that's difficult and challenges the best riders in the world yeah and then you also have to make a track that works for regular people yeah. that are just there to have a fun time challenge themselves and try hard enduro is tough like that it's definitely unique it's very tough like that it's a fine line hard to find the happy medium i think that's one difficult part about growing the sport is yeah. and enduro across the same yeah exactly it's like how do you scale hard enduro back yeah. for the people that just want to enjoy it at a moderate level mm. without going crazy i think the knockout style formats are are good for that yeah knockouts good and then also say silver kings in idaho for example they do the the gold section so they added on yeah i like that so there's the Splits. main course that's silver and then yeah well you get to a split gold section yeah pro line amateur line that's how it was last weekend in hawaii and some of those splits were freaking gnarly oh, really? yeah. oh my god i think that works well though it's more yeah, it work does. For the promoter, but then the pros are happy and the amateurs are happy. 100%. The only problem is sometimes the amateurs get in front of the pros. That's the other thing. But it doesn't really matter. Yeah. I mean, I, I, with the course walking thing, I feel like I could see how it, it y you can make an argument both ways where it's like, well, if they, you know, the, if, if you have track walk, then it could be, it could make the racing better in, in some ways and it could maybe make it safer i guess if there's like exposure that you want to avoid or something like that i guess you can make those arguments but then you could also make the argument that it makes the racing worse because you're getting rid of an entire element of off-road racing which is reading the terrain yeah i feel like that's that's a huge factor i mean that's like a huge factor is like who can read the terrain, learn how to understand how the terrain reads in the yeah. first place. And then like learn throughout the race. I feel like that's just, it, it almost removes an element of the race. I yeah. think. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And there are some races like King of Motos. I'm trying to think of other, like, Oh, we walk a bit of silver Kings, but yeah, most of our races are track walk. But then, like, say you get to Page, I think we need a track walk because you, an inch off track, you'll fucking break both your legs off. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, and a track like Page, where the final knockout race is like insane feature based obstacles, yeah. that makes more sense. Yeah, for safety. But yeah, majority. Yeah, as I said, I'd be fine. No track walk. For everyone, sure. if as long as everyone doesn't walk the track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it'd be hard to do because you have like public riding areas and you have these other mm. factors that make it t harder to do. But I'm with you. I, yeah. And that's what I always liked about the Hair Scramble series, the Western Hair Scrambles. Yeah. This was like a real off-road race. Yeah, Hair and Hound. Yeah, Hair and Hound is you. I never raced Hair and Hound, but I did the Hair Scrambles and it was like drop the gate, go. And sometimes we would ride and I had an e-bike and I would like ride some of the infield stuff because you're allowed to. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it was just reading terrain yeah. and reading the course and figuring it out as it comes at you and not missing the, the, the markers and yeah. not overriding the course on the first lap and then learning. And yeah, I felt like it was more, there was more there. There was more to draw from. Like it was easier to make a gap. I feel like, because if you were better at reading terrain than somebody, then, yeah. then I feel like, Everybody at the top level, speed wise, can hit a corner fast. Yeah, I mean, but then all the other aspects that go into it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you got like motocross. That's why I never like took to works too much. Was I was like, this is just like a glorified motocross race. It is. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's big uh, talking point. It's not off road enough. I don't know what it's like now, but when I used to race it, that was always what people were talking about. Yeah, I mean, and it's still fun. I mean. If you were on a 450 that was set up for it, like I could see it being fun, but I don't know. I like the adventure elements of hard enduro and yeah. off-road. It's just yeah. it's dope. 
yeah at the end of the day that's probably my biggest driving factor yeah so you're and other times but it's like when i go home it's kind of a distraction like i love australia i'm gonna move back there when i'm done racing like i think it's unreal um so i always remind myself that like at the end of the day i'm going back so it's not like sometimes you can go down the rabbit hole i'm missing out or is it going to be different but at the end of the day this is now i'm going to go go home I'm able to change i don't know but for sure i want to move back just because um, it's home. Yeah, friends, family. Um, yeah, so I just go home one, once every once every year. But as I was saying, it gets a bit of a distraction. You go home, you see all your mates. It's around Christmas time, it's the holidays. Oh, yeah. So I think the perfect time is three weeks after Enduro Cross because I don't need to be training. I can take three weeks off. This is what I did this year. Let the body recover. Yeah, have fun with the mates. Go out, do whatever three weeks then back here then into training i feel like if you're there for too long of a time it's just not productive right you can go there with the intention i'm going to train and do this but then you just get carried away well, it, for me personally i need to be like is that because you're not surrounded by your peers that are in similar mindsets yeah so exactly like over here i'm it's meant because Life in the States, it's just, everything's about racing and how can I be better. Like everything that I do throughout the day is for racing and to be better. We're at home, we've got my mates, live on the farms, so there's always stuff to do, which I love doing, just being outside, working around the place. Um, and you've got other stuff to do and distractions, um, which is perfect. But I think for right now, I need to focus on racing so I need to be here in the States doing my job. And then when that's done, then I can go home and, and be normal. So I think the sweet spot, this, I've realized this because in the past I've gone home for too long, too little, but I think three weeks is perfect. Have a blowout, then get back to here. Have a blowout. Yeah. I could see how going back there for a, f a few weeks could be good and rejuvenating because yeah. you, you go back there, you get you have a few grill outs, you eat some lamb. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, you've been there. We showed you. Oh, so good. But I like we go to the pub for dinner Thursday night with your mates, and then you end up getting back at like five in the morning. So you can't be doing that. You go a little bit too hard. Yeah. <laughs> well, you just get carried away. You haven't seen your mates all year. Right. So I think that's why. For me, three weeks is perfect. So I, like my brother, he can go. He's a bit different. He he could say go there and um not get distracted as easy let's say does he just ride more does he stay riding and training like what is he what why nah, is he probably just doesn't go out as much or not that i go out crazy, yeah will, but like, we're just like di we're different. a little bit yeah we're different Do he's you, more content where i get home i, I want to go see all my mates do everything you would have so. really liked enduro cross like 10 years ago five years ago eight years ago back when like gary sutherland was racing and then Corey uh, Grafunder, Garfunkel, Kyle yeah. Redman, we'd all go out and party after the races. It was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't, I'm not a don't want to be the the partier, but uh, for sure I like it. But that's what I mean. You go home, you do that. But then when you're in the states, it's all business. Yeah, exactly. So there's a time and a place. It's funny how that that's how it's all changed. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like even the culture here, it was almost like enduro cross was used to be more of like a party yeah and now it's like all business yeah but well, if i have a good night in enduro cross we go out me spencer a few others depends who's had a good night if i had a shit night i'm going I'm back going to the going hotel to yeah cry to sleep but <laughs> exactly thinking about everything it, you did wrong yeah yeah but in enduro cross we go out yeah maybe like the last round yeah but, but like that's after the race, like, right. it's not every weekend, no, it's not no. every night. Like, Yeah. And there's even, like, kind of a cap on it now, I feel like. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, after a night of racing, I mean, we don't get done till 
11 o'clock, yeah. 12 o'clock sometimes. So going out after the race and then if you have a few beers, think about it. That's like probably one of the worst things that you can yeah, do for no. your body. Yeah after a race yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. i'm saying especially if next weekend when you, think, you have another yeah, race yeah for sure i'll only do that if it's a couple weeks off yeah well, we used to uh, we used to have big breaks we used to have yeah. one in like when now it's not no and the boom, schedule boom, boom. for this year it's tight tighter than ever we only get one weekend off right yeah so no drinking then what do you speaking of enduro cross what's oh, i want to talk more about hard enduro but uh, what would you prefer, enduro cross or hard enduro? If you had to race one, hard enduro, just because like enduro. the adventure of it, the adventure and the diversity. Like I feel like it's pretty hard to get burnout with hard enduro, just because there's so many different types of terrain and and types of riding and way to ways to train. You know, when enduro cross, you just cut laps. Five, five, six weeks into enduro cross training, you're like, Phew. yeah. Can we change this track? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do? think we're lucky because we get to do both. So like, yeah, hard enduro for half the year, and you get over that. Now enduro cross time, you get over that. Hard enduro time. So, do you find it hard to switch gears between like long form endurance racing, like hard enduro, and then short form sprint racing of enduro cross? It's way different. So different. Like really, the only similar stuff about it is the technique the bike skill yeah everything else is complete opposite mm -hmm. it suits some people better than others yeah exactly you know what i mean yeah 100 percent. yeah it's like a colton different. haker for example is like one of the great best indoor riders ever yeah but then you take him to the hard enduros and he it's struggles different. to yeah, yeah it's different it's different it's yeah. so much different or you got graham jarvis the best hard enduro rider but indoors he's not too special yeah yeah exactly yeah it's wild i mean enduro cross is explosive short and and exhausting and yeah. intense yeah. where like hard enduro is less explosive more slow wear you down stay alive survive yeah. be smart you know what i mean like it's, yeah there's different so many more just di so different yeah i know and i mean what you have to do uh the two series part of our contract but it's as i said it's perfect it's good to break it up how's it been being on the new factory gas gas team because you're there well last year they had taddy which was their first their the first gas gas factory rider and then now they got you and you, you came off rpm ktm you were with them for what three or four years three years yeah so you came off rpm ktm and now you're now you're under the the big tent what's that like how what's that process been like unreal i love it it's so good so so much easy easier in the aspect of just bike work and worrying about less stuff like now i just got to worry about me and getting better where last year i was doing bike work up until nine at night and then got to cook dinner and you got to rest and hydrate and do everything think about the track where now i can just worry about what i've got to do and nige my mechanic legend He's got the bike dialed. Trav, the WP suspension guy, he's a legend too. Tanner, it's pretty cool. So it's just me and then the trials guys um, right now. Maybe next year it'll expand, I'm not sure, but it's cool. It's just our little team. It's sick. How And how's the bike? How, so you, good. It's so good. I love it. You look good on it. You look super comfy. I like, like it, Like it's yeah. just an extension of you. You know where your front end's going. It's predictable it looks like yeah no it's meant um honestly personally i don't get carried away with like i'm a bad tester i don't really know what to look for or i feel like it's good because then i'm not worried about right. stuff i'm not it's on me but then for sure you maybe you're missing a bit of ground you can make stuff better so there's good and bad but i think just simple like it the bike's mean it's good yeah before King of Motors, actually, it was funny. We did some testing, um, and I'd never really done it before. Uh, so I had no idea what to expect, and I was kind of nervous because they all come out. They drove a couple of hours just for me and then had different sets of suspension. I'd go out, ride, come back, and I'd, what do you think? And fuck, honestly, I don't know. It's, it's perfect. It's good. <laughs> for sure, there was some I could tell. It was, I just ate worse or, or better. 
but then in the race it turned out to be perfect my bike was it was really good so I, that was a relief because i've done some testing in the past and completely screwed it so hard like went way the wrong way because you're so, thinking about it too much yeah or well, maybe not enough i don't know just i don't really know what to look for i i think sometimes if you don't really know what you're feeling it's better to just say i don't know yeah yeah uh, yeah i don't want to i'm not going to make stuff up yeah and say i'm feeling this yeah exactly so, i feel like a lot of people do that to try and like yeah sound like they know what they're doing yeah and i can i understand the pressure with that too like you know you're the hired rider you should know how to set up a bike yeah yeah but if you don't know what you're doing it's okay yeah. to just be like honestly i don't really know yeah and with bike setup i feel like just get the bike good get the bike yeah. like a 6.9 out of 10 yeah. or like it or In like an range. 8 out of 10 or yeah. 7 out of 10 if you can get it 7 or above 6.9 or above like now you're in the zone of like okay now just ride it yeah now just yeah. ride that thing, ride that thing and get better and just just learn how to ride it. Yeah. Just figure out how it reacts and how it works. Yeah. And just keep going on that. Cause exactly. if you just the more time that you put into trying to make the bike better and better and better and better, it's like, yeah, you can make a one percent, two percent, three percent, five percent gain on that, but you, you know, you can there's more to gain other places, I feel like, yeah. after a certain point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I was pumped for round one. My bike felt unreal. The so 300. I was relieved, yeah. Have you gotten the 350 at all yet? No, no, not yet. I don't know when I'll get that. Did you ride PDS last year? No, nah, linkage. 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 You've been on the linkage year. bike. Yeah. And then that's probably the biggest difference from the KTM, just linkage. I can't really, like a handling wise, I don't, it's, it's good can't really tell a difference but i for sure notice it hitting on stuff are you talking about on the 300 uh yeah because you're a pds on the 300 yeah exactly yeah where now i'm on the linkage so it just hits a bit more but it's just get get used to it it's not bad it's kind of like you just get used to it and then it's fine right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. how i felt about it too but i could see an enduro cross not having linkage how that could really be helpful especially in the matrix yeah there's good and bad yeah um but then it's less strong i think like i broke two years ago i did pds on the 350 from joe cross that's right. a lot of us broke them do they couldn't the swing arm stand. i don't know what the go was but so was, as you said in the matrix it was good and some other bits but then say the jumps it was not as good the less bottom travel, out easier yeah yeah linkage jumps nice and where do you think the the linkage is better like jumping and handling overall do you think i think handling overall it's better yeah, as I said, I don't know, but if I had to pick linkage. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I remember, I feel like the best bike that I ever watched at Enduro Cross was Cody Webb's 250 KTM PDS bike. Like 16 or something? Yeah, 16 yeah. or something. And that the way that that rear shock just went up and down through the rocks, and it's Cody too, he's obviously incredible, but he was like accelerating down these rock sections down the backside with like big gaps and a log at the end. He was just like, whoop, down the backside of these rocks and that shock was just going, -da 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 -da. and just moving so much. And I'm like, damn, dude, what do I got to do to get my bike to handle like that? I'm like, K -k 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 yeah, because I think he was the first one to do the PDS. Was he? I'm pretty sure. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think he kind of started that trend. Yeah. 350s, 250s. What's your thought on the 250? I always felt like a 250 would probably be pretty good for Enduro Cross. Yeah, just not enough juice. Not enough juice. Yeah. I know. Everybody's going so big now. Enduro Cross is just jumps now. Bro, it's so gnarly. Yeah. Like, the races this year, it, it was like every every lap around like five times it was like the most explosive jump that you ever did yeah it's like you no, every lap big log like this high off the ground like the logs sometimes are like off the ground like this yeah. and we're just what are the cranky wrist. Up, up. ankles snap ankles breaking wrists do again, snapping again, again. do it again 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 I, I wonder because they're the old in arena cross people maybe and i mean it's exciting for fans and stuff and that's the way they envision it. Would you prefer it being jumpy or do you like it if it's more technical, like big log that you can't really jump, but you have to like single over? Yeah. Would you say that was like four years ago, like 2018 and before it was more, less jumps? 
I feel like when I started, it was like that. And I thought it, I enjoyed that. When it's more now, technical. Now it's good, for sure. But yeah. It's massive jumps. Yeah, massive jumps. There was a couple of years ago, what was it, 2021, where it was like all flat landings. Yeah. Like the landings were, like, you'd have a jump, like the face was like this steep. And then the landing was like this far away and like, yeah. like that steep. Yeah. So you're like, whoop. And then just fall out of the sky and land on the worst landing you ever saw in your life. You're like, dude. Yeah. Bro, can you put some more dirt on that landing, please? My yeah. ankles aren't going to make it through the night. I think they just get excited. It, <laughs> well, and then if you're Sack not going to jump it, then everybody else will. Yeah, I know. So you got to sack up. You have to you do gotta it. You got to go there with a massive sack. You do. Yeah. Ready on the first lap of practice. Yeah. Like there's no messing around. Straight to business. It's gnarly. Yeah. It's Enduro Cross is definitely, definitely gnarly. Yeah. It was gnarly this year. It's like you're always happy to get out of the race healthy Healthy, and like ready to go to the next one it's just hard on the body it is um hard enduro it's dragged out touch wood less injuries but just like the endurance aspect where enduro cross is pounding on the body pounding lucky it's only a couple months long but yeah it's almost like you if you start training too early for it then you're kind of beat before the season even starts you have to like ramp up to it taper down and then boom race the season yeah. and you can't really with it being tight you can't really make improvements mid-season yeah you just have it's to too, too short do you like it being short like that i do smash it out get it done yeah get all your travel plans done spend all the money yeah just on the road that i'm pretty much a gypsy honestly so it kind of suits me just because well this year will be better because i can just fly the team will take my stuff but like last year, I had to drive to everything, so it's nice just race this weekend, drive to the next one, train on the way. Now it doesn't really bother me; I can do whatever, which is nice. Are Got you flexibility? Are you gonna fly in and then fly back to North Carolina this year, or are you gonna stay on the West Coast? Well, I was looking at the schedule the other day; it's so tight. It's so honestly, tight. I would probably just stay out west. But then North Carolina, it's perfect because I've got the track and everything. But then there's no one to ride with. Which I hate riding by myself. So then it will probably just stay out here. Are you going to do any riding, enduro cross riding in like April, May when we're over there for the hard enduros or no? If the team wants me to do stuff, but probably not. Just after TKO, a bit before TKO, and, which is August and and only after. I feel like having people to ride with is so important. I mean, you're out mm. here riding with Tristan you said you're up in Canada now you're in Arizona what's it like training with Tristan is it it's good that's why I travel so much because to train with people because I hate riding by myself I just feel like personally like it's just not productive right you train with someone you're, you're racing against someone you're competing bouncing ideas watching them it's just, and then over, overall more fun um, but training with Tristan it's, it's good pretty lucky are you able to learn a lot from him? And yeah. then what, what kind of, he's just kind of a maniac. So yeah. what's it like training with him on a daily basis? Cause he's like ultra, comp- ultra, ultra, ultra competitive. Yeah. As we saw this morning. As we saw gym. this morning at the yeah. gym, dude, what a maniac. Yeah. It was pretty funny. We play this game called, for, for those that are listening, we play a game called red dot at the gym where we, I think Taylor showed us this game where you have to, play hacky sack and you hit it three times and whoever catches it after the third time gets to throw it at anybody that they want as hard as they can and if you catch it after they throw it at you then you can throw it back at them so it's like a fun warm-up with a little bit of pain mixed in yeah right yeah yeah yeah. and i think it's one of tristan's favorite games he just goes into hard on he gets so (laughs) he loves it he goes straight for jared every time yeah he starts screaming and yelling (laughs) <laughs> well, the other week, I was a target. He hit me probably 10 times. Yeah. Oh, he loved it. He loves it. Yeah. It's like, dude, what's going on with you? Yeah, so it's good training with him, and then everything's a competition. Everything's a competition. Yeah. I feel I'm definitely more chill. I don't uh For sure with riding, definitely, but if we're on a run, I'm not going to sprint home. Like, I don't want to. But he will. Sp- yeah. To win. Yeah. That was a bad example, but yeah. It's, Say if it's, I took off, he's going to take off. You know what I mean? Right. 
Yeah. He's not going to let Wait, you he win. Takes alpha. See it happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I could see how that could be good and bad too. Cause if like all you ever want to do is win, you could almost like go too hard a lot of times and put yourself into yeah. a deficit. A few years ago, I got Lyme, uh, not Lyme disease, um, Epstein Barr from overtraining. So I'm pretty mindful now of not overdoing it. So it's hard because naturally, as you said, you want to do everything to the maximum and keep going. You don't want to be the last one to, you want to be, oh, let's go home now. Right. But you sometimes you have to, like you're four hours into a ride. It's like, all right, I'm done. I'm not being productive anymore. Right. I've got to ride again tomorrow. It's going to be smoke, so I'm done. I'm going and, and getting ready for tomorrow. It's not like you're giving up. You're just preparing for tomorrow. So it's, I feel like I'm getting better, but it's hard to find that it's line. It's hard. Especially when you're training with your competitors. Right. And like Tristan never says, let's go home first. No. He does the, oh, what are you thinking? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> just say it. Just say it. <laughs> say it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so I, it's, a, it's a fine line. It is a fine line. I feel like every great athlete goes through that too of like a period of overtraining yeah. and like learning, oh, okay, I, I there's a there's a threshold that I have to keep everything within here. And if I go beyond that, then that's then I'm training too hard and I'm starting to go backwards. I'm starting to bury myself too much. Yeah. And obviously I'm still learning and learning what's best for me and I only know what I know now. But I think I've noticed recently, like around eighteen years old, like and even all the eighteen year olds now, they're just watching goggins and going so hard yeah. and ride every day of the week and ride forever and but where i think like and i for sure went through it when i was 18 or so you just get really excited and just a big cock off really yeah it's a big cock on off. Instagram. yeah i've been i've been training harder than everybody harder yeah. longer stronger yeah. and it's almost like a it's it's almost like ingrained in the culture of the sport too where it's like you know you have ricky carmichael and and even other athletes from other sports like lebron uh not lebron james but kobe bryant and like all these well, yeah. guys that always work so hard their whole thing is about hard work yeah and it's almost like it's a part of the natural progress and then you know you could almost make you could also make an argument that you almost have to go through that to know the value of resting so that yeah. you can perform at your highest and it's still like even though you overtrain sometimes it's almost like that can create a foundation of like fitness and just mental strength that yeah. you can use that that will carry you through the rest of your career and as you go through the rest of your career you almost like use this foundation to kind of continually sharpen your your skills and 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 your knowledge of how to train and get better yeah. so that you're using less overall effort yeah. to make the same gains yeah like every, everything goes into it yeah plus and at the beginning of your career you, you that's when you have the most amount of gains to make so you want to go hard 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 yeah hard, hard. yeah but then for me example it bit me and i had to take a year off so in hindsight it was good and it's to now it's worked out and i'm happy but yeah for sure it's funny you see all the 18 year olds it's like Settle down, mate. Yeah. Get yeah, off Instagram. It's so true. Yeah. It's so but we, true. Uh, we all go through it. Yeah. It's almost like it's a part, natural part of the progress. And when you had Epstein Barr, what was that like taking that year off? Yeah. Well, when I say year, it was the hard enduro season. And then I got back in August and raced enduro cross. But it sucked. Like, I was definitely burnt, not burnt <laughs> out mentally, but physically. But I didn't as i said like i was in that mindset and just go 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 and then tristan used to be like that too he used to go so hard so hard when now he's for sure slowed down but it's not like weaker you're just smarter right um so then i was training i'd see what he does and he's doing so much and then i'd i need to do this then we go out and ride with buddies and it's who finishes last if that makes sense and Yes, that that bit me for sure. But it's good to learn. But yeah, I just had to chill. 
do nothing. I didn't uh, know what was wrong with me. Like, I kept getting sick. And then uh, I was in Canada, actually, and then got blood tests, and I had um, Epstein-Barr. So I had to take three or even four or five months off. Did they give you any medication for that, or is that just a... a nah, you just got to chill. And let your I body kept getting strep throat and um, tonsillitis, so they'd give me meds for that. But Epstein-Barr, you just got to chill, do nothing. It's just like a virus that's inside you that... Yeah, I, I don't fully know, but I'm pretty sure everyone's got a bit of it. But then if you it can surface if you do too much or if you get sick, I think. That's so crazy. Yeah. I got close one time, but then I think Jared told me to back it down, buddy. Yeah. Do you use heart rate data to know where you're at physically and know when you need to taper off? Yeah. I don't look at it. I used to, but I don't know. It's hard. I feel like I don't know. From what I've heard, you... Yeah, it's hard. I don't really know if you can fully base. Uh, I just got a feel of myself. You got a feel. Yeah. Because what I've heard, like you you don't fully know if the heart rate, it could be true, it could be fine. I don't know. But I feel like what works for me just a feel. I and then having Jared Becker is so good. I like uh, last year I just did my own stuff. But this year, like every week's planned out. So it's just easy. I just like following. Just takes the guesswork out of it. Yeah. You know, you wake up and you know exactly the things you got to do, and then you you do them, and it's perfect. What if you? What if Jared has something on your program that you're not that you it, it, that you're not feeling as good for you? Do you t- communicate with him and be like, "Dude, I'm too tired for an hour and a half moto," or like, "How do you yeah. do that?" Honestly, been training with Tristan for the last few months. So we kind of do, and it's hard to stick 100% because one day out of rain, you can't do it. And then you need a three-hour motor, but you've only got a certain amount of time or this and that. Um, so we kind of do our own thing a little bit, but for sure talk to Jared and ask him questions and, and work it out. Communication. Um, yeah, but pretty much he's been listening to Tristan. Because he's been doing it so long and he's he knows what works for him. He's made the mistakes and knows uh, maybe not the best way, but the way for him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He, I feel like he can handle a really high workload too. Yeah. So it's almost hard. Yeah, to, everybody's high. different. Like I can handle a decent workload, but there's definitely a point where if I go too much, I'm like my brain stops working. Yeah. I'm like, I get dumb. I'm like, dude, I'm just yeah. beat, dude. Yeah. Like, I can't do this much. I could, but it's not yeah. doing me anything. Then you just start learning how to go slow. Yeah, exactly. So that's the, yeah. You need to, yeah, optimize every training session. Yeah. And then it starts to go down. So you rest day. Yeah. And I'm looking from the outside, like it doesn't doesn't work. Yeah, like the more more suffering doesn't equal more success. Mm. In a lot of ways, it equals less. Yeah, you know, to a degree. That's why it's hard. I feel like throughout my career, and I'm like at a point where I'm like semi-retired now, but I feel my training sessions got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter as I get further into my career, just because obviously time also, but you start thinking, how can I maximize my time on this bike? And yeah. So, and you've yeah. got such a big base where me, I've got so much to learn and so much skill to get better at. So it's, yeah, we're just at different periods. So let's say like Tristan, he's like, I don't need a ride today. Where maybe I should, cause I need, I've got a lot more ground to make up, to make up, but you don't want to overtrain. So as I said, it's that fine line. Shoot. It's so hard. Yeah. It's hard. How are you feeling for Grinding Stone coming up? Where'd you end up in uh, King of Motos? Fourth. Fourth? Fourth, yeah. And you got fourth last year in the series, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just the, yeah. It was good. Just lap. How many laps was it? Three. Three, but they're all a bit different. King lap of- one, we're all together. All, I was top four. And then lap two, just got caught in lappers. Did Like, kept moving, but they just, the top three got through quicker. And then... There was the gap in a GPS and 
and they just got better. Um, but yeah, I feel like it was solid for me. Do you make any big mistakes that set you back? No, nah, no. Nah. So that's why, like, there was some good stuff. Obviously, I want to be on the podium, and I was pissed I wasn't. But like, I didn't for sure last year and previous years is pretty loose and just make stupid mistakes and and waste energy. Where round one, I was it was just smooth. It was like nothing really special, nothing really bad. It was just smooth, which I guess is good for hard duo. And how do you close that gap? Because I feel like the top three guys kind of broke away and then the top two guys slowly broke away. Yeah. So how do you close that gap? Is it a fitness thing? or No, is it fitness just... is really good. Uh, just skill, I think. Because you know what it's like? You've The track's only so wide and there's a couple good lines, sometimes just one line. And yeah. when you get to lappers, you got to get creative and, and ride harder lines. So yeah, yeah. When it gets to that, yeah, I just need to get uh, better skills to, to make it through those sections quicker. Are you comfortable in that desert terrain because you grew up in the desert in Australia? Yeah. Is, that, is there anything like that? Yeah, a little bit. Not rocky. We don't have many rocks in Australia, really. Sand. Yeah, but King of Motors is my favorite race of the year. Really? So, yeah, I like the desert. The GPS, like the adventure aspect. It's nice. Yeah, pinning it through the desert flat out. It is fun. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, what about Paige? How do you like that area with the sandstone? Paige is good. I like Paige, yeah. It's so different, huh? It's full commitment. It's yeah. gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, went riding out there last week and we're doing some crazy stuff. <sighs> so this year, I think it's going to be, uh, pretty gnarly in the race. What's your goal for, what's your goal for grinding stone? Podium. Podium. I want that podium. It's probably all that you want this year, huh? Yeah. You don't want anything but it. Yeah. Yeah. Getting closer, getting better, and just worry about me. Yeah. I feel like you and Ryder are both kind of like the second, third, fourth place guys. Like, you and Ryder both made up a lot of ground this year just yeah. from watching you at King of Motors. Yeah, for sure. Like, King of Mo everyone was, or not everyone, but us top four, it was so much tighter than the previous year. Yeah. Uh, like last year, Tristan smoked everyone. And I was, I don't know, I was probably 40 minutes behind or or an hour, where it was way closer this year. So for sure, little gains, little gains. How about Cody? Yeah, back from the dead. Back from the dead. Just a beast. Yeah. Yeah, he's the man. Especially King of Motos too, because it, it is pretty fast pace too yeah know? it's not just technical say like tough like raw where it's just a rock garden the whole the whole time yeah yeah so no he's the man i feel like he's got a good shot at it this year i mean he's seems like he's more fit than he's been in a long time and he's got the skill obviously yeah. especially for a race like grinding stone where it's all these big features he'll be able to get through that stuff clean yeah the whole time and yeah so we'll see yeah We'll see, yeah, you got some dogs go. serious contenders. That's what I mean. So, like, yeah, to get on the podium, it's it's not easy. But not easy. You can you can do it. It's what we work you for. You got to get those bonuses, though. I know. You know, your bonuses are probably day. only top three. Yeah. Yeah. It's rough. It's a tough life. <laughs> what is, um, someone says, like, hard way to make an easy living. It is. <laughs> yeah, straight up. Yeah. Super nah, hard. That's good. It's what we love. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you seem to have like that grounded gratefulness about you where you're like aware of what you have and the opportunity in front of you, like we were talking about before, where I feel like being aware of that and being able to have a little bit of perspective on your own situation can be so fruitful in the game of getting better and performing and doing your best. Yeah. And you hear like older pros say that, like, don't take stuff for granted and this and that and like as i said before like i love where i'm at right now with the team and everything's unreal so i obviously want to perform and, and keep it how it is you know for sure for sure do you find it hard to to be comfortable in this situation or is it do you feel like this is where you're supposed to be the whole time yeah, like nerves, you mean? Or? Yeah, just like pressure from, you know, you're riding for a big company, they're paying you money to yeah, go win. Like. For sure. 
but I mean, I don't know. It's on. It's weird on race day. I get nervous for sure, but I just everyone's different. But for me, just really try and focus on what I can control, and then it'll be all good. For sure, like I'm pretty relaxed. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and Tanner, the team manager, he's chill. He's good, and we had a talk after King of Motors. Like, I wasn't too happy, but he was really good and said, it's all good if you did your best. That's that, and so that was cool. Um, but obviously, I really want podium. So I'd say the pressure is on myself. For sure. Them, not really. They just do what they can to give me the best stuff, and so then she's up to me. Yeah. Yeah. When you get nervous before races, do you are there any – specific techniques that you use to calm your nervous system do you get hyped up before the race do you try and stay calm do you use breathing techniques because i i felt f the nerves are part of it yeah i don't think you're ever going to be able to get rid of the nerves before a race but i don't think you want to either because getting that nervous getting nervous and like knowing that you're about to go race yeah. is like what gives you that extra five, 10% that, cause you always go harder during the race. Yeah. So, so it's necessary for the, for the extra bit of focus that you're going to need for the event also. Yeah. And it's like muscle memory. You get nervous, you know, it's game time. Right. Exactly. But I, for me, if I get too nervous, then I'm kind of on the back foot. It's like the right threat or challenge. Right. I look at it. So like if it's a threat, like you're on the back foot, your body's not working properly, your mind's foggy. Um, wherever it's a challenge, like it's doable, it's uh, reachable, you want to be there, you want to do it, and you're ready to go. You're still nervous. But uh, so that's what, when I get nervous, that's what I try and think about. And then, like honestly, King of Motors, I wasn't too nervous. Erzberg last year, I was way too chill. Like I wasn't really ready for the the carnage let's say like i was not really nervous at all i was ready but there's just like 40 so over here there's like six top guys let's say give or take over there there's like 40 that are all super close so i was chilling it was all good um anyway so i was too chill there so there's for sure a line but yeah i feel like treat it as a challenge and and you want to be there and um and it's not just mental like it's get technical but like your blood flow and you got to be in the right mindset for your body to work you know what i mean if you're on the back foot and fucking nervous and yeah. thinking about stuff too much you're screwed scared if you're scared to pull the trigger yeah it's gonna get pulled on you yeah where well, if you look at it, look at it as a challenge you're ready to go it's gonna be hard but this is what i do every day i'm prepared this for this is what i want yeah and how did you learn that and how did you develop that mindset and that awareness to know that that you need to tell yourself hey this is this is that this is a challenge this isn't a threat this is a challenge that i want and it's something that i'm going to go get it's yeah. an opportunity for me yeah it's a uh, trial and error just talking to certain people and being lucky to hang around like uh with the professionals i have say like taylor you, Destry, Tristan, Cody. When I first moved over here, Cody used to take Gus and I riding, which was sick. Um, I'd be pretty thankful for that, just showing us around and showing us the way. So that was cool we did that. But just hanging out with people and watching what they do and, and talking to them, asking questions. Do you read any books? Have you? Uh... Yeah, yeah, and books, yeah. Honestly, I'm bad. I need to read more, but. What's a book that you've read that you felt like you took, that you gained a lot from? I like autobiographies. Like, if I'm not into, or like everyone, but if I'm not into something, I find it hard to to focus and knuckle it out and finish it. So I said like school, I hated school. Just because I kind of felt it was not useless, but I just wasn't into it. But say, like, they'd give me a book at school, I'd hate it. But I'd read an autobiography at home, I'd love it. Um and just get stuck into it. So just learning different things from different people and like relatable stuff. Like they say what they went through and it's like, oh, I felt that or I know what he means. Yep, yep. Um, and then talking to Tristan, Tristan um, with Red Bull, like goes to the Red Bull 
facility. I don't know what they call it, but it's got like physios, sports psychiatrists, dietitians, everyone. So just asking questions about what he's learned. And he's meant, Tristan's good. He, and I feel like he shares his knowledge with everyone. If that makes sense. And it's just whoever takes it in. Yeah, it's like the abundance mindset of of acquiring knowledge and then sharing it with people without thinking that helping them is going to hinder you yeah type of yeah and mentality. same as cody i think their main goals are to grow the sport which is sick so like cody's always shared his knowledge yeah done stuff to make the sport better tristan also yeah for sure so us young guys are lucky yeah i think it's important for the older guys or just everybody to be helpful towards the competitors and that's what makes off-road so great anyway yeah you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. I, I think motocross is different, um, but off road, it's, it's it's almost like everybody wants to see their competitors do well in their own it's right. It's for sure different. Yeah, to motor. yeah, yeah. And that's why I made the switch years ago because it's a bit more my style. Like Tristan and Cody could be in the mindset of I'm not telling them anything. Like, yeah, I'll tell them when I'm done. But right now, I need to stay on top for sure. But they're chilling. They're still on top. That they've got it dialed as well as sharing information i think it's because there's so much experience i mean cody has so much experience that he can draw on from the at, at just from his career yeah yeah and, and you can't teach that so he experience can experience is keen it's so keen yeah yeah so he can teach you little lessons and things that he's learned along the way and he can still rely on his experience to propel him to the top and at the end of the day you still have to put in the work and you still have to apply the things that you learn. Yeah. So uh, unless you're going to apply those things, it doesn't really matter anyway. And yeah, Cody is such a genuine, good giving dude anyway, I feel like. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like they share information with everyone. I've, and especially if you ask a question and, and are keen to learn, um, they're, they're, they're not afraid of sharing anything. Yeah. hundred percent. I remember uh, I'm not trying to put you on blast and we can cut this out if you want, but you were like having some cramps and stuff like that yeah. like, last year or two years ago. Yeah. And it seems like you've just got that sorted. So what's your hydration protocol like yeah. for the races? Um, How did you work that out? Touch wood. Like I feel like I'm, I'm better and uh, I think everyone cramps, you know, but at a certain point, everybody like yeah. back in the day, like last year and the years before that just debilitating like you get to honestly when a race works i don't honestly i don't fully know but something was going on maybe it was the epstein bar like years prior i don't know but a works race is two hours long an hour in i was like done which is ridiculous like i'd ride and train every day and i could only last an hour huh but just really fatigued but then the hard endurance, I get to two hours and just be fully cramped up. And I don't care what anyone says. Like, I couldn't push through that. I was fried. I'd, like, literally, I'd lay on the side of the track just gone. Your forearms are, like, yeah. cramping this way and your legs are cramping that yeah, way. Yeah, you bend your leg in, your quad cramps, you bend it out, your yeah. hammy cramps, yeah. you can't get away from it. Oh, it's the worst. Mate. So, yeah, I went, that was tough. But, um... Just better fitness, better base, better hydration. I for sure sweat a lot. So just keeping the salt up and then getting more efficient on the bike, like using less energy. Yeah. You know, if you're pushing everywhere, you're going to get to a point. Your heart rate's through the roof. You've only, it's a ticking time bomb. Yeah. Cody is so good at that. Yeah. But it was funny. Tough like Raw a couple of years ago. I was laying on the track and then Colton passed me. I was laughing with Taylor the other day too because when Taylor used to do the hard enduros, I'd like start being front. Halfway through the race, I'd just be on the ground, just mangled. Cramping right by. bad. You good? Yeah. No, I'm not good. I'm not yeah. good, but I don't need your help. <laughs> yeah. Just leave me alone. Yeah. Let me sit here and cramp. Yeah. But uh, anyway, then Colton, I remember, um, was talking to Dad. He's like, he just needs to get tougher. You know, he's just not tough enough. And uh, I was like, that guy <laughs> and then uh i feel like last last year there was a race colton was cramping and uh having a tough time and i passed him and i was like there we go 
go back and never forgot about that. Did you yell at him on the way by? Hey, you just need to get tougher. Yeah, I should have. <laughs> I forget where it was, but there was a time where I was like, yep. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> feels good. Yeah, it feels good. Equaled that one back out. Yeah. Shit had to come. Yeah, he's definitely not afraid to throw out a little. He's definitely not afraid to be controversial. Yeah. He's which is good. But it's good because like, yeah. he's always ready to challenge you. On, yeah. on whatever you're thinking about or whatever's going on. Yeah. I feel like he's always willing to challenge your thought process and stuff. And yeah. I think it's a lot of people it's probably hard to deal with, but at the end of the day, it makes people better because yeah. he's like, and he's probably seeing a little kid that's just halfway through the race pulled over and has had enough. Right. Always don't get it. Right. Exactly. But man, I was, well, I was plus as like the OGs, like we, the OGs aren't going to be delicate with the, with the yeah. up and comers. Yeah. Like sure you annoying. definitely need to be tougher. Yeah. You know what I yeah, mean? yeah. 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 We're not going to take it easy on yeah. you. And that helped for sure. I didn't forget about that. Yeah. Cause like every time you're getting moving. cramps, you're like, I just need to be tougher now. Yeah. <laughs> just keep pushing. Yeah. I'll show him. I'll show him. There's definitely a certain amount of toughness I feel like is required for hard enduro. Yeah. And just managing, that's also what I've gotten better at, at the cramps. Because, like, personally, cramps aren't, like, from the mind, you know. It's your body's cramping. It's not like, don't think about it, I'm not going to cramp. Maybe to a certain degree, but when I start cramping, just manage it. Slow down. This was last year. I haven't cramped this year. I'm going to, but, you know, it's just dealing with it. Do you food intake during the race. Food and nutritional intake is like yeah. key for you. Jared's actually helped me a lot this year. He had a good way. We've been working a lot on strength. So it's like, if you can use... 50% less effort on a certain move that you're doing, you're going to save energy and be able to go longer, you know what I mean? Just saving energy pretty much. So that was a good way to look at it. And that's what we've been doing and I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah. The strength thing's an interesting argument because you know if you take the extremes, you take a guy like Billy Bolt, he's all strength. Yeah. He's huge. He's yeah. A, he's a big beast and he like uses his weight and his strength to throw the bike around and he makes it look good. So it's almost tempting for people and riders to want to put on bulk and, yeah. and, and size. But if you have like a small frame, like if you take a rider LeBlanc and you make him 200 pounds, his cardiovascular system and his lungs are going to have a really hard time yeah. keeping up with all that meat. Yeah. Cause we're marathon runners at the end of the day. Yeah. Like they're tiny. Yeah. 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 Oh, you're, that, yeah, you're saying that. You a hard your races, because our races yeah. are so long, you know what I mean? Right, exactly. But then, so it's the fine line. That's what makes them so hard, is, yeah. is you have to use all the strength that you have yeah. and all the cardio for that strength. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think strength has uh, helped. helped. That's what we've learned so far, so maybe it's not true, but I'm hoping it is. How much do you weigh right now? 180. 180? Yeah. Getting bigger. How much do you weigh? I'm like, I just got back from Hawaii. I was eating twenty seven dollar poke bowls left <laughs> and right. I'm like one eight, probably one eighty five, one eighty seven right now. Oh perfect. Between eighty five and eighty seven. Unit. <laughs> it was actually yesterday we had a big day and I lost ten pounds. Like it was one eighty two in the morning and then one seventy two. What that'd just be a water weight, I think. But yeah, that was crazy. I'd never never checked. Did you I'm feel just... more jacked? Did you were you like more chiseled by the end of the day? Can you notice well, it? I um I thought I'd be like skinnier, but I kind of looked in the mirror. I'm like, oh, he's still looking alright. <laughs> <laughs> thought I'd be a little skeleton, <laughs> but now nah, I want to be eating a lot too. Eating being fueled. That's also what I think's helped, and what me and Jared have been working with is eating a lot, good stuff, hydration. What do you like to eat? Uh, everything. If I had to choose my last meal, steak, chips, and gravy from an Aussie <laughs> pub. But no, nah, I mixed eat... together, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm particular Aussie style, with that. Aussie yeah. I think it's an Aussie thing, but yeah. Is I it eat. an Aussie thing or is it a you thing? Maybe I take it to another level, but I for sure... 
I've been adopting that. Yeah. I like, like that at way. the the last fork, everything's off the plate and everything's like on. Oh you know yeah, I mean? exactly. Yeah. I don't know. That's how Aussies do it. They take if you have like even if it's a chicken parm where you have a chicken and then some noodles or whatever and then a salad, salad. they'll eat they'll take piece of salad, piece of noodles, piece of chicken, every bite, they like keep it all together. Tastes the best. It's all together. It is it is good that it's way. Good. I've been trying like, it out and it's like definitely I don't think I've ever eaten just the steak, then went on to the you call them fries and then the salad. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. It's not right. You gotta do it all together. You gotta mix it all together. Maximum taste. And I've been doing it that long that now every the last this is getting weird, but it, the last fork is everything's gone. It's like a goal f- to yeah. make it everything everything's here and then now everything's gone yeah. in one shot. <laughs> I don't think about it, it just happens. It's pretty good. I think for sure people look at me weird though. Because over here, that's not normal. In Australia, I think it's normal. But yeah, it's Aussie style I, I for sure. I feel people looking at me. Really? Probably. Well, when They're you're like, mixing like weird shit together, it's like ice cream, steak, <laughs> salad. I want <laughs> it all at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nah. So before race, let's just like the night before race, what are you eating? You going for steak? Yeah, been playing around with that lately, actually. For me, I don't think it matters because you hear like you don't want to eat red meat. Um, here? Hey, when you're here, you say? Oh, just recently, I've been playing around with. Oh yeah. yeah. Red meat, um, because you know how you hear people say red meat's not good before a a race or because it takes too long to digest this and that. For me, I can't feel a difference. Same. So, the night before, a lot of the main priority is like potatoes or rice or pasta, chicken or steak few veggies not too much meat or too much veggies uh business before the race but then after the race a lot of meat a lot of veggies and minimal carbs um but then in the morning uh again carbs potatoes bread pancakes blueberries eggs and sausage is my go-to that's a lot yeah and also it's um tastes good you know it's yeah. not just a big bowl of oatmeal yeah that you want exactly. to gag every time sometimes eating in the morning is tough yeah where that it's mint it tastes good i always like to treat myself the night before a race it's like mm-hmm. my last meal yeah like okay we're gonna eat. you need to yeah and honestly days leading up for sure but that, that's every every meal for me really i Especially feel like with, it's a mindset thing too yeah i i eat a lot but i want to because then i feel like I'm not going to get depleted or right. burnt out. I feel fueled. Charged up. Yeah. Do you think it's good to have a little fat on you for, for yeah. the races? Me and Jared were talking about that. I think for hard enduro, it's important to not be bulky, but, well, yeah, be bulky because that race is so long and it's impossible to fuel properly during the race. Like right. you'd have to literally eat three meals for the yeah. calorie output. Exactly. So to have a bit more to start with, or well, it's like, uh, talking about books my favorite probably would be toby price book um and he's like for rally like he used to go to the gym flat out get like lean but then by the end of that guy would be fully done like nothing left where now he goes in a bit chubby a bit a bit heavy and by the end he's in his ideal rate weight range yeah you know, he's got it in the especially for rally because they well, they race for like two weeks yeah exactly so you need you need a bit yeah, it's impossible reserves. to yeah. get in as much as you as you're burning. Yeah, so I think for hunter it doesn't hurt to have a bit. We're not fat by any means, but no. uh, but Just I think a bit more is not bad. Yeah, like like Cody says, a little hair scramble pouch. Yeah, Just a little extra something yeah, something yeah. <laughs> to yeah. get you through because it's hard. I, it's like the worst feeling getting hungry in the middle of a race where your stomach starts turning. Yeah. Like fuck, I gotta get some food. Yeah, but because we deplete ourselves. Yeah, like beyond. Yeah, and so, your body's like, bro, bro, bro. Yeah. I need some steak. I need some potatoes. And you're like, sorry, you're just going to have to wait. Here's a disgusting little gel. Yeah, three more hours. Yeah. Yeah. How do you push through that? What's your technique for pushing that aside and continuing forward? Just focusing. Um, quicker I ride, the quicker I'll be done. <laughs> Simple. That's a Tristan mentality. Yeah, who is it? I think it's Toby Price, actually. He said that. Really? Yeah. The quicker I get done the quicker i'm done quicker i ride quicker i'm done 
It's true. But uh, yeah, just as I said, like with the practice days, you ride your best when you're fully locked in, and then you kind of forget about the pain, especially if someone's behind you. You got the pressure. That's good. Yeah. Because it really gets you in the zone, and you think less about how shit your life is right now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because it's pretty dark. It gets pretty yeah. lonely out there. Yeah. That's the worst. Like enduro racing hard enduros you're out there it's three hours in there's nobody around you it's lonely starting to get dark you're, you're out hungry there for so long yeah you don't even want to dig deep anymore yeah that's when shit gets real yeah 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 your mind goes into a different spot yeah yeah it's tough it's tough well good man i'm stoked for you you seem like you're killing it Glad the bike and the new team's working out. It's been really cool to watch you rise and become who you are now since I met you in 2018. Yeah, you've seen the full. seen the full, seen the full the Reardon movie. transformation. Yeah, that's cool. It's been a real pleasure, and, and yeah, I hope the best you. for you moving forward. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Oh, 100%. Anytime, mate. Anytime. Oh, yeah. What's your uh, – you want to share your social handles for everybody? Socials. And, yeah. Uh, Will dot Reardon thirty nine is my Instagram. Don't have Facebook. Uh, yeah, that's it. There Instagram. you go. Go check him out. This dude is the real deal, a real Australian boy. Thanks for coming on, man. Best Thank of luck you. to you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely.